We're going to go now to Marty Secular Merton's Garden in Berkeley. And um, Marty's Garden, Marty lives uh, in the uh, hills um, near Tilden Park. Uh, she um, has a large lot. Uh, some of the plants in the front yard were put in in 2002, but most of the plants in this garden were just planted last year in 2019. Um, she has planted more than 100 species of native plants in this garden, which she designed jointly with Andy Liu. She has five types of manzanitas. Uh, and behind the house is a shady woodland garden. She has also uh, planted Dutchman's pipevine to attract the iridescent blue-black pipevine swallowtail butterfly. This is the only plant that that butterfly can lay its eggs on. More than 30 species of birds have been seen in or above Marty's garden. Uh, the, a number of host larval plants on which butterflies and moths will lay their eggs that Marty has in this garden include wild cherry, currants, sagebrushes, lupins, manzanitas, uh, to name a few. So now I'd like to um, go to Marty. And hi, Marty, how are you? Hi, Kathy. I'd like to thank you and your team for this wonderful opportunity. Welcome to my garden. Uh, I'll um, turn, turn this around. So here's, a, here's an overview of my garden. Um, welcome. This garden is designed and planted to attract and support wildlife. What do wildlife need? Water, shelter, uh, food, and places to raise young. So um, our urban pollinators are our companions in the city. Hummingbirds, butterflies, bees, all kinds of birds. And I see them all here in the garden. So I'll get a little closer and um, can see some of my favorite plants. So in the garden, um, what's, what's, what provides water? I've got five bird baths, some with fountains. Um, food is supplied by flowers, nectar for bees, butterflies, hummingbirds. Um, birds need berries and insects. So when you start to bring back the native plants, you bring back the native insects. And with native insects come the native birds. So this is one of my favorite plants. It's a um, verbena illicina de la mina. It's a lilac verbena. And um, here's a view of it. It um, blooms year round. It's a great nectaring source for butterflies and hummingbirds and bees. And uh, I recommend it, very easy to grow. But getting a little more of an overview. You see, I've, um, I've planted native grasses in kind of a swath coming up from the corner here and going down to these native grasses here. Um, native grasses are a host plant for the skipper butterfly. They lay their eggs on it. The caterpillars eat the grass. Um, so um, I'll show you my, a little close up of my fountain. This is a solar fountain. That's a floating uh, solar panel right there. And the sound of the running water attracts butterflies and birds. So um, down here on the path, there's a uh, tall ceanosis. This is a Cenosis thursiflorus snow flurry. It's unusual because the flowers are white. Usually Cenosis has blue flowers, but these snow flurry are a pure white color. And um, here are some Basilia californica. It's a wonderful plant. Um, you don't see it in nurseries too much. There's a bumblebee on it right there, you can see. Um, California has over 200 species of native bees, and Berkeley does too. Bees love Basilia. Um, here's a, a sage, a native sage, that's the um, dominant plant in California chaparral. It's salvia mellifera, or black sage. Very, very vigorous. So um, here behind us is um, a manzanita. Manzanita means little apple in Spanish. And I'll come around to the other side and show you the berries. The flowers are urn shaped and come in early spring and are attractive to butterflies and bees. And then the berries develop and attract the birds. 
So here's a creeping scene of this. Um, you see the the um, the blossoms. And Cenothus also has many, many species in California from tall trees down to um, ground covers like this one. So um, on this side, there's <laughs> quite a bit of color. The bright yellow are buttercups, Ranunculus californica, which are great nectaring plants. And then here are um, two different colors of Asoltia californica. Those are um, red chief and cream colored California poppies. And um, here's another kind of colorful shot with the um, verbena, Lucina de la Mina, the cream colored poppies um, and the red poppies and the native grasses kind of cascading down the hillside. Let's come around and look closely at the manzanita. So this manzanita is called, um, let's see the sign, Arctostaphylus pajaroensis, the pajaro manzanita, pajaro manzanita. And one of the things I love about it are the, the shape of the trunks. The trunks are beautiful color, kind of a cinnamon dark color and very shapely. Here's a close up of the, the berries. So. They are little, the name is manzanita, which means little apple in Spanish. They do look like little ripe apples. They're attractive to birds who eat them. The pioneers ground them into a powder, added water, and had a um, kind of a cider drink from them. So here's um, a view, kind of a bird's eye view of the garden from the front porch. So, and then the background, you can see the, the ridge, the East Bay, East Bay Ridge of Tilden Park. So I try to grow some species that are just native right here. Um, now we'll go to the backyard. My backyard's larger and um, you can look at some of the plants there. So um, when I moved here about a year and a half ago, the backyard was mostly very real jungle. I had to take out a whole bamboo forest and a lot of trees that were kind of had been hacked, but weren't, um, they, they weren't very productive. So I, it was a quite a undertaking. But I really enjoyed um, working with soil, adding organic material and, and planting this collector's garden over 110 native species. So here's a, it's a little sunny, but here's a view up into the backyard. Um, here's a scene of this. Here's a florist. Here's a, a close up of the, of the flowers. And today, there seem to be clouds of a very small native bee just um, covering the whole, the whole shrub. I call the flowers electric blue. So, so it's a pretty bright blue. Um, and then I'm going to show you some of my native grasses. I planted a little swath of native grasses over on the side here. Right now they're in the shade. So um, these are native grasses. Native grasses grow in bunches. We call them bunch grasses. There's spaces between them because they're sharing scarce resources. In California, that's, they're sharing the scarce water. And um, so in between these spaces in the spring, you always find wildflowers. I've planted a few. The yellow are called um, frying pan poppies, the Sheltia lobii. And the blue ones are blue-eyed grass, the Cerinthium bellum, which makes a really nice pretty pattern. The native grasses with the wildflowers. This native grass is called um, Melica toriana, Tori's melic. It's a bunch of grass that likes shade. Some of the others here are Melica californica, and some Carex prigacillus, some Pastuca californica. It's good to have biodiversity in everything, including your grasses. Here's some of my um, aforementioned water sources. There's a little fountain here, which I put, I made it kind of shallow so that birds love to take baths in it. 
and here's a um, fountain with birds. And then in the back, I have a fountain with a frog. And it's really nice because um, birds will often sit on the head of this frog and lean down and take a drink. I found out that birds can't swallow unless they put their head back. So they lean down, sip a little bit of water and put their heads back. I do have one species of bird here, the band-tailed pigeon, which is very unusual because it can dip its head in and not, it doesn't have to put its head back. It can just drink deeply while its head is down, which is an unusual bird. I sometimes get more than 30 of them here. But quite a few large dove, the band-tailed pigeon. So um, I'll show you one of my host plants. Um, people have been talking about the um, Vespin's pipeline. So I've planted some over here and I'm very excited because for the first time, just today, a pipeline swallowtail came and flew around my garden. I thought, oh good, the butterfly found me. So um, here's some nice photos and, and also the sign. So Mr. Lokia Californica is the name, the Dutchman's pipeline. It's called the Dutchman's pipeline because the flower looks like a Dutchman's pipe, a Meerschaum pipe, maybe Sherlock Holmes pipe. Here's the butterfly. It's beautiful black and it's got orange spots underneath and iridescent blue. And then the caterpillars are start out very small like this. This particular, this particular butterfly lays its eggs all in a bunch and the caterpillars all hatch at once, right next to, excuse me, keep each other warm in a little bunch. Here's a slightly bigger caterpillar. And here's the chrysalis. So that's a whole life cycle. Butterfly, egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, and butterfly again. Here's another butterfly that I've attracted to my garden that I see quite a bit. It's the Anna's Swallowtail. And um, they now have adapted to eating the non-native fennel. But um, uh, I grow yampa, which is the, the native host plant. So the host plant hosts the caterpillar. The caterpillar eats up the leaves. They almost never, they can't, they don't usually kill the plant because they've evolved, they've co-evolved to accommodate each other. Here's the tiny caterpillar of the, um, has a little white stripe, it's a tiny caterpillar. And then the caterpillars get bigger and get more colorful. And if you, if you look at, yeah, so on my gampa, you can see these caterpillars. And finally, the chrysalis is fascinating because I find that when the chrysalis is formed on a brown stalk, it's, it's brown and camouflages, but on a, I've seen them also bright green on a leaf. So they, um, they adapt to the color around them, which I'm not sure how that works. One of the miracles of butterfly metamorphosis, I'd say. And here's just a little focus on, on the leaves. Um, they're heart-shaped. There's, um, so Mistelokia californica is endemic here in California. There are other species of Mistelokia around the world. There's a Chinese one and I think an East Coast one. But this is the only one we have here in California. And since the plant's increasingly rare, so is the butterfly. So, um, views up through the garden. Here's, um, the, the garden's quite deep. It goes quite a ways back. And I kind of planned it to look like kind of a um, wild woodland area. Uh, it's very shady. So here's a view of one of my shade, um, shade sections. The tall spikes you see are Hookera maxima. That's a, um, coral bells. Here's some uh, bleeding hearts. And that's, um, that's Dicentra formosa. Little flowers look like heart shaped. I don't know why they're bleeding, but that's what they're called. And then here's a lovely place to stretch out, watch the birds. This, um, the plant here is called um, redwood sorrel, or oxalis oregana. And um, I like to go under redwood trees. Unfortunately, I have one here. This is the Sequoia gigantea. And um, probably at least 80, 90 years old. I have actually five mature conifers, mature native conifers. That's one of them. And right now the, the uh, oxalis is in full bloom. It's a very pretty little white pink striped flowers and kind of a clover-like leaf. 
again, that's um, redwood sorrel. And you'll see them growing all over the redwood forests of California. So here's um, a little pan across the area that used to be a bamboo forest. And is now, I had, I had this wall made of river stones. And um, the, some of the shade plants are uh, thimbleberries, which are delicious raspberry-like berries, um, wild roses, uh, nine bark, um, uh, the candy stripe flower, uh, Aquilegia formosa, which is columbine, um, fringe cups, Tolima grandiflora, uh, ribes glutinosum, uh, like ribes like sanguinium glutinosum, which is the wild current. Here's a close up of some things. This is fringe cup. And you can see it has very small flowers, but um, this is a great plant. I recommend it highly because it can take dry shade. Most plants that like shade like wet, but this likes dry shade and it's very reliable. Here's a little wild rose. And, um, very pretty to have a, a rose that's growing naturally in the woods. They, they grow throughout Sylvan Park. So um, up above, we have um, some Mimulus guttatus. It's bright yellow. It's Mimulus guttatus. It's a seat monkey flower or bog monkey flower that loves water. There's actually a lot of water right here because the fog comes in, condenses on these tall conifers. And sometimes when I come out in the morning, it sounds like it's raining. So these bog mimulus are happy to getting all that extra rain. The, the plant here is, um, we used to call it miner's lettuce, but now we call it Indian lettuce. And my brother likes to forage in Children Park for this plant. He takes it home, washes it thoroughly and puts it in his salads. It's actually sweet, uh, juicy, and um, healthy, it's good greens. I planted two or three, now I have hundreds. Great self-seeder. I personally don't use mulch because I find that without mulch, it's easier for the natives to self-seed and spread. And then also um, the native bees, many of them build solitary nests in bare earth and they can't really penetrate the mulch. That's why I like to leave some bare earth. So um, we'll move along to <laughs> move along to the upper part of my garden. Try to hold the camera a little steadier, sorry. Okay, so just traveling down the path. Here we have a nice view of a native maple. There are only two native maples in California I know of. The big leaf maple and this one, the vine maple or Azure Circinatum. Right now it's in bloom. So this tiny little pretty red flower. I think it's a lovely tree. It loves shade, which is good for my garden. And it actually grows better in shade than the sun. So that's the vine maple. And um, here's another very popular bird bath. Birds seem to love this one because it's in the sun a good deal of the day. They, they seem to come regularly for baths in the afternoon around the same time. So um, this is a lupin. And I particularly enjoy the, the, the leaves of the lupin. They call it, they're called pomate because it looks like a hand with, a, with fingers. And then um, this time of year, I see, um, I've seen fields of these Douglas iris in bloom in Tilden Park. This is the Douglas iris, um, Iris Douglasiana. They range in color from white all the way up through deep purple. Oh, it's getting shady up here now. Here's, there's a slope here of uh, mimulus or uh, monkey flowers. Here's some that are in bloom. And um, I'm hoping the rest will come into bloom eventually. This, this one's, um, this is mimulus bifida. It's a lovely cream color. And this is a mimulus orientiacus, the deeper orange. Again, from this part of my garden, you can see over my roof. Well, there's a whole flock of birds that just went by. Looks like cedar waxwings. Then here, um, these are uh, cream-colored poppies. Here's an elderberry. So, um, again, these elderberries are great for the birds. The humans can use them for elderberry wine and elderberry jam. 
this is a special poppy called um, Orange Chiffon. It's kind of a, a selection of, of, uh, of poppies. That's really pretty. These are um, yarrow, which is a great nectaring plant for butterflies. Um, oh, what kind of elderberry? This, this elderberry is a the blue color, the blue flowered elderberry. So it's um, it's uh, Sambucus uh, mexicana. Yeah. And this is a coffee berry, which has great berries also for um, oh yes. Yeah, um, elderberries are edible. Elderberry wine, elderberry jam. <laughs> coffee berries are not. This is a coffee berry plant. This is a lovely little plant called um, Philadelphus. It's, uh, it's a, a native mock orange. So um, how am I doing for time, Kathy? We started a little bit late. And so you have a few more minutes. I would say like another maybe four minutes or so it would be great, Marty, if you could managing that? Sure, okay. So um, I guess I'll just show a couple more plants. But, um, looking up here through, through the, um, the woods, you can see I've planted um, ribes, they're the wild currants, and um, ferns. And um, the probably easiest to grow fern is the western sword fern which is um, polystichum lunatum, but they've also got deer fern, uh, giant chain ferns, um, and uh, polystichum lunatum, this kind of fern that comes up, it's a, it's, an, it's a perennial, so it dies back and then comes back up. And here's some of my prize plants. These, those are, um, you can see them, those are trillium. The trillium's a beautiful plant. Um, it's um, trillium chloropetalum. It's got a deep purple flower, three leaves, and then um, a flower with three petals. Here's, here's the close-ups of some- Maybe about a two minute the, morning, Marty. So if you can think of the last things that you would like to say or the last uh, image you wanna show us. Okay, well, um, thank you for coming to the garden. I'd like to thank again, thank Kathy and all her team for making this possible. It's been a pleasure for me to show you through the garden. Um, Maybe I'll talk just a little bit about my favorite nurseries. So um, I do love Pete's nursery out in, in Oakland, um, East Bay Wilds, because he is amazing. He has such amazing knowledge and amazing selection. Um, let's see. Um, I like to go to right near my house is Native Here. That's a really amazing place because they gather the seeds and cuttings directly from the wild and they tell you where they're from. The nursery is divided into the Tilden section, the Redwood Park section, uh, not the Ablo section. So you can buy plants that are just native right to your spot. Um, Kristen Hopper has a lovely nursery called um, Oak Town on Channing and Second in Berkeley. that has a great selection. She's a great source. She always has um, the Aristolochia Californica, the pipeline. So if you have trouble finding it, she has it. She has a way of, of propagating it by using um, loops of loops of those stems, and they just kind of root themselves. Um, Watertown Watershed Nursery is a good one. They do large uh, restoration orders, and then I drive all the way up to Santa Rosa every year to a nursery called Cal Flora, and they have a great selection and very healthy plants that thrive well in my garden. So um, thank you again, and. Um, hope to see you next year in in real reality. <laughs> so, Marty, thank you. Thank you so much for taking us on a tour of your garden. It was beautiful. You're welcome, and thank you, Kathy. So I enjoyed the butterfly information, and you're having put up the posters for us to see. Uh, it was interesting to hear that you don't uh, mulch, so that you have uh, unmulched areas for ground nesting bees, and also so that the natives can reseed. Um, so thank you so much, Marty. 